Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. Um, my name's Phil Murdoch. I'm one of the assurance partners here in Perth and also currently the, the head of audit for um, BDO and WA. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome you today to, that, to today's session. Um, today we're hosting our annual 30 June Natural Resources Reporting Update. Um, but before we begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge that we are hosting this meeting on the traditional lands of the Noongar people. And we pay our respects to them and their cultures and elders both past and present. So what has really been the past couple of years, um, these 30 June accounting updates um, has been a significant amount of um, technical content uh, owing to the, the three significant uh, new standards that have now been introduced. Um, I'm pleased to say today's session will be a little bit more of a practical update um, and the video team will cover a broad range of topics, uh, including running you through some new accounting developments, um, some common accounting issues we are seeing in practice, um, and some of those relate to the post-implementation considerations relating to mainly RISB 16 and RISB 15. Um, we'll also cover uh, ASIC surveillance and focus areas as we head into 30 June uh, and some things uh, in, in that area that uh, you know we think you need to be aware of um, and we'll also share with you some common business themes we're seeing um, around ESG and corporate governance which is attracting um, as we well, well know increased stakeholder interest. Um, today's session will be hosted by uh, Ash Woodley who's a partner in our IFRS advisory team um, Ash will be supported by Kay Kelly, who is an Associate Director in our IFRS advisory team. And we'll also be joined by Jane Gouvernet, who is an Associate Director in our advisory team and corporate finance team. And Jane will discuss and cover uh, governance topics, risk management, and, and also ESG. Um, so I'd like, like to now pass you over to Ash to get the, the, the session underway. Um, but thanks for everyone for joining. and. Um, obviously the increased interest in, in these sessions. Over to Ash, thank you. Thanks, Phil, and good morning, everyone. So as Phil mentioned, myself and Jane will be presenting today and Kay is manning the chat box to respond to any queries that come through. So please make use of that as we go along this morning. As you can see, we have a lot of topics that we wanted to address today, so I thought it would be good to quickly run a poll and get everyone's views on what is most relevant as we head into 30 June. So I'll just launch the poll. Um, hopefully everyone can see the poll on the screen. Um, so if I can just ask everyone to complete this and let me know which topic you are most interested in. Firstly, is it ESG, which as Phil mentioned, is a hot topic lately and you may be wondering how it will impact your business and reporting? Are you most interested in the recent developments in accounting standards and interpretations? Or maybe it's the existing standards causing concerns, modifications under AASB 15, share-based payment, modifications, refinancing, leases or impairment. Or the final option is the future transitioning from special purpose to general purpose financial statements. Okay, so I'll just give it a couple more seconds for people to vote. Okay, great, we have excellent engagement in that. So I will close the poll. And hopefully the results are being presented. Um, so there's pretty even spread across all topics, um, which is great. So I will stick to the agenda as we have planned um, and aim to cover off on all topics. So starting first is 
ESG, which Jane will run through. So I will hand over to you, Jane. Thanks, Ash. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Ash, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Sure, has that come through? Yep, that's come through, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, the newest emerging risk, ESG, um, not really. Certainly it's been a topic that's been um, discussed for some time and Europe is in itself way ahead of Australia in addressing ESG and its um, corporate governance. But it does feel like it's an emerging risk to us and I think it's something that we need to um, get across fairly quickly. Um, the analogy I give is, is when you think about remuneration reporting, um, post 2008 GFC, um, remuneration was a topic of discussion, but certainly there was no statutory requirement. Um, 2011, there was introduction of statutory requirements in annual reports. So it wouldn't be surprising given particularly that Europe has led the way and that we have an example and that we have an, a push, which I'm going through in a minute, that um, similar won't happen in Australia. And of course, um, depending on um, um, political decision making. But certainly currently there's no clear statutory requirement to report against ESG in Australia. Um, we are seeing substantial national pressure and international pressure to address climate change and of course increased um, corporate social responsibility. And just recently as a couple of examples, we saw stakeholder action or, or shareholder action uh, for remuneration and reporting against um, ESG uh, for Woodside. And we also have seen the backlash on the social responsibility for Rio um, and the Duke and um, Gorge matter, which is ongoing. Next slide, please, Ash. So the pressure is definitely escalating. Um, why is it escalating? Uh, firstly, the Australian and global regulators and governments um, are pushing us to report against ESG criteria. Once again, this is, is a um, push and no statutory, real statutory requirement, um, an expectation. And you can add to that the regulators being um, the ASX as well. But we're also seeing private equity and institutional investors. Um, looking towards and asking assessments from various companies on their ESG reporting and compliance. Um, this is because they are in themselves looking to fu the future. They understand the pressure. They have seen what's happening in Europe and they know that for longevity or sustainability, they'll certainly need to um, ensure that their portfolio is full of funds that are ethically responsible. Of course, there's also that concern over um, exposure to individual directors and executives. Um, if um, they don't respond to ESG pressures, um, either from regulators or um, investors, and this can expose them to um, potential litigation and shareholder activism. Um, we see that um, this particular type of pressure is probably the most um, pressing and can be the most brutal and um, it um, is followed on by regulator commentary but certainly um, being aware of um, your shareholders and the position they take is really important. Uh, next slide please. Thank you. So, you know, what's it all about? Where does ESG fit in your um, typical framework? And there's discussion around um, it, that it should fit within your risk framework. There is no actual um, framework yet within Australia um, that is recommended. However, we do go to, um, once again, our European counterparts who have established and have um, developed frameworks. But the, the reality is, is um, there are material risks and it's broadening and it's becoming quite complex um, and that we need to respond to it. So your typical risk framework um, is the one 
that is up on the screen now. Um, that's where you have your organisational risk framework, which has your methodology, your appetite, and your organisational risk register. And then your risk registers are um, filtered through the div through the various divisions within your organisation. And this is the same with work health and safety risk appetite. Um, and we've seen it. Um, initially out of work health and safety, then developed into financial reporting, and is certainly now across non-financial. Um, it does surprise me that some organisations haven't really got a firm framework in place because it's one that really needs to sit alongside um, strategy. Uh, I think the introduction to this particular um, section was um, governance risk and are you protecting yourself? And certainly strategy is about performance, having a, a robust risk framework in place that suits the purpose of the organisation is um, for the organisation's protection and ESG is a really good example of that. Um, next slide please, Ash. Um, and when we talk about where it fits within within our risk framework and that it's actually broader than our traditional risk framework, we can take something from comments made by ASIC only just um, very recently. Um, and they ask directors to consider climate risk as part of risk management, as part of risk management is not solely um, within risk management, to develop and maintain strong and effective governance, oversight management and reporting. That is always part of the risk management process. Um, comply with the law, in particular the adequacy um, in terms of fundraising, continuous disclosure and, and annual reporting. This is when the where the pressure for um, disclosure ar around ESG becomes evident and um, this is where we'll see continued pressure until uh, probably in the near future, as has been the case in other countries, there will be a statutory change um, to require all organisations to report against ESG. Um, and certainly when you're looking at this as part of your preparations for the changes over the next year or so um, until it possibly does become obligatory, um, you can start looking at um, other um, sources such as the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure and that's the one um, recommended by ASIC. So from that you can possibly take a lead that, that that's um, the direction they are heading. So next slide please, Ash. So this slide is um, a BDO slide that gives you some measure of where you may be sitting in terms of ESG. Um, we'll do a poll in a minute, but I firstly just want to take you through it so that you um, have a better understanding of what that process is. You can see um, at the right end, it says strategic integration and purpose driven. Now that's where Europe is currently sitting. So you can start to measure yourself against what may be the expectation in the near future. So hopefully you're at least at curious um, so that the, you're thinking about it in terms of your organisation, you're thinking about um, sustainability reporting, you're including it within your risk disclosures, within your various um, public documents. The next is actually uh, moving to um, a more robust, robust framework in terms of, you know, are you certi certifying your uh, sustainability reporting? Um, then it moves on to proactive. Um, do you actually have um, risk management and um, monitoring investigation processes in place? Investigations in terms of your supply chain, not just your specific organisation. And so we see in terms of internationally that this is, um, and human slavery is a perfect example, filtering through not only with the specific organisation, but certainly the supply chain. And we are seeing um, from um, European organisations before um, contracting with um, companies within Australia, getting them to um, assess their, their or respond to ESG questionnaires. 
Um, the next one is a strategic integration where that's when it becomes actually part of your business. Um, you um, have a you measure it in terms of a return on investment and it's part of your everyday value creation and integration within your strategy. And of course um, the final is purpose driven. We may have some companies, particularly in our top end, that may be at strategic integration and purpose driven um, stages in this journey, um, but certainly around your business model is um, very attuned to sustainability and you can um, uh, discuss sustainability fairly robustly um, publicly. We'll just take a poll now if we can go to that. This is for the purposes of you um, being able to measure yourself against others in the in um, the um, process that will need to be or is likely to be undertaken over the next um, two or three years and certainly depending on parliamentary and, and regulatory response. So I'll let you respond to that. Ash, can you let me know once we've had sufficient? Yes, so just give it a, a couple more seconds. We're at about 50% now. Okay, that's great. Um, I'll close the poll now, just to make sure there's no last minute votes. Okay, and results are sharing. Okay, that's interesting. Um, that certainly gives you a measure. We've got somebody at full integration, which is, is um, fabulous and uh, well prepared, or 3% are well prepared for what may eventuate over the next couple of years. Um, and certainly responding to current um, private equity, institutional investors, shareholders, um, no integration. Um, 53%, it may be time to start thinking about that and raising that with your executive and board um, uh, so that um, with time you're not caught out and it's not a just-in-time race um, to disclosure. Thanks Ash. Final slide now. Um, I also just would like to um, mention to you that we do have two uh, clean Energy Regulator um, registered auditors here in um, BDO. There's uh, I think about four that are registered under both categories. Um, uh, we have two within BDO so that if you're looking for some support, um, certainly an assurance over sustainability reporting, um, Glyn and Phil Murdoch are the people to get in contact with. But the takeaway I think for this um, particular ESG session is, is we've seen where people are, where they sit. We um, are aware now of where Europe are and the likelihood that we will start to move towards that simply out of pressure from our investors um, and our shareholders. So um, really start thinking about this seriously and um, discussing it with the board. Thanks Ash, I'll hand over to you again. Great, thanks Jane. That was very relevant and insightful and as you highlighted, ESG is commanding more and more attention, um, not only with boards but from various stakeholders. So it's critical to keep up to date with this topic. So moving along now to some tax insights following the recent federal budget. And firstly, we have lost carryback provisions where the government has announced an extension to the temporary lost carryback rules announced in the 2020 federal budget. This extension will allow eligible companies to carry back and use tax losses from the 2023 income year to offset tax paid on profits from 2019 and subsequent income years. So it's effectively you re receive a refund of income tax paid in previous years. If an entity elects to use the lost carryback provisions, 
um, adjustments will need to be made to reflect the tax refund rather than showing it as a deferred tax asset to be recovered by a reduction to future income tax payable. And I've just got the accounting entry highlighted on the screen in the green box. The second point, um, the government has also announced a 12 month extension to the instant asset write-off measures until 30 June 2023. So these measures provide eligible businesses with an immediate deduction for full cost of depreciating assets for assets acquired after the 6th of October last year and in use by 30 June 2022. And then the final point is the extension of the exploration credits to the end of June 2025 um, to incentivise new investment into this sector. So a very brief overview of some current tax matters that we're seeing. Um, I've included on this slide the contact details of our local tax experts. So if you have any queries or need any assistance on any tax related matters, please feel free to reach out to one of them. Okay, so moving on to the accounting update. So first of all, we have the latest developments. A reminder of the amendments to AASB3. So in summary, the amended definition of a business now has a narrower definition of outputs and the new definition includes the concept of a substantive process. So in order for there to be considered a business, you must have an acquired set of activities and assets must include as a minimum an input and a substantive process. The amendments also introduced an optional concentration test, um, which we are seeing used quite regularly since the implementation. And this is a shortcut to concluding that certain types of acquisitions are not business combinations. So this third amendment clarifies that to be considered a business, an acquired set of activities and assets must include as a minimum an input, and a substantive process. And then these two together significantly contribute to the ability to create outputs and that will give you a business. So acquisitions of entities or projects involved solely in the E&E activities are likely to be asset acquisitions as because they're still in the E&E phase, they wouldn't have any outputs. And then generally these acquisitions don't include an organized workforce. Although care will be required for projects for which e, e work has been carried out and in addition there are proven and probable reserves and a plan for site development. Moving up the stage of operations and looking at acquisitions of projects in the development phase. Um, so this will, quite, will require careful analysis as these may constitute the acquisition of a business if they have an organised skill workforce that has the necessary skills, knowledge or experience to develop the project. So generally, these would include geologists and engineers as part of the acquisition. And then the final stage within the extractive industry is looking at acquisitions of projects that are in production. Um, so these are likely to constitute the acquisition of a business, given the outputs are already generating and they typically come with the organised workforce. Moving on now to the optional concentration test. Um, so like I said, this is a shortcut to concluding that certain types of acquisitions are not business combinations and can mean that an acquisition could be accounted for as an acquisition, even if it would meet the definition of a business if the detailed assessments were performed. So just to clarify, if you fail the concentration test, it doesn't mean that you have a business combination. It just means that you need to go through the detailed process to make that conclusion. So in applying the concentration test, the acquirer asks the question whether substantially all of the fair value of the gross assets acquired are concentrated in a single identifiable asset or group of similar identifiable assets. For companies in the extractive sector, 
Um, common assessments we see include whether production equipment can be grouped with land lease rights and also whether E&E stage properties can be grouped with producing properties. For the tangible assets assessment, it's necessary to consider whether the cost to remove the equipment and use it separately is significant and therefore whether it's required to be grouped with the land lease and considered to be a single identifiable asset. And for properties at different stages, an assessment of whether the risk characteristics of the two types of properties are similar is required to answer this question. So if you have exploration and producing properties generally in um, close proximity in terms of the where they're located, um, you could conclude potentially that the risk characteristics are the same and then applying the concentration test end up with an asset acquisition. And also just a reminder that this is an optional test. Um, if the acquisition satisfies the concentration test, an entity may account for it as an acquisition, asset acquisition. Um, but you can also perform the detailed assessment if you believe that you have a business combination and if there are advantages to accounting for it as such. So moving on to the next recent development um, in regards to employee entitlements. Um, so in the last few years, underpayment of wages has become a pressing issue in the Australian economy. The AASB has released a staff FAQ to remind entities of the accounting standards that may be applicable if you determine that you have had employee underpayments. So we're currently seeing a lot of work in this area. As we know, all these awards are very difficult and there is a lot of risk involved. So I just wanted to highlight to everyone to make sure systems and processes are in place and to look at this FAQ. If you potentially have this issue to determine whether retrospective application is required and what the accounting will look like if you're required to recognise additional payments. And, and also linked to this is the employee entitlements for casual employees, which was a big deal last year following the Rosato court case. So this year um, it's still a big deal and there is now talk of an appeal and what will happen on appeal. There's also new legislation and whether the new legislation will be, need to be applied retrospectively. The new legislation um, doesn't, initial interpretation of it is that it's not, doesn't follow the deci decision reached in the Rosato case. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of questions come through from entities who may have recognised a provision for underpayment of casual employees in the prior year. And they're asking whether these provisions can now be released. Um, at the moment we're saying just hold tight. Um, it depends on specific facts and circumstances and it's still um, preferable to obtain legal advice to clarify whether your casuals are true casuals under this new legislation. Um, but we are seeing some entities who are now able to release these pro pro positions, the pro previously recognised provisions with this new legislation that has come in. So as I mentioned, um, the answer is not clear cut yet, but it's more a watch and see and we'll keep you updated on any further developments through our BDO newsletters and other BDO communications. And now um, a very recent issue is around software as a service arrangements. So only in April this year, um, there was an agenda decision by IFRIC um, and this topic is moving very rapidly. So what it is, is an interpretation that clarifies that costs that are capitalised that actually relate to a software that is owned and controlled by a third party, um, these, these costs should actually be expensed, whereas in the past, I think many companies would have capitalised them. 
So the question you need to ask is, do you have capitalised costs that relate to configuration or customization costs for software that is controlled by a third party? So if the answer is yes, then treatment of these costs will need to be looked at. And if these costs need to be written off, this will need to be done. We need to determine whether it needs to be done retrospectively um, or if it can be recognised in the current period. So as I mentioned, this is a very recent issue that is evolving, but does need to be dealt with prior to 30 June. So please reach out if you have any intangible assets that may be impacted. And the final topic for recent developments is going concern. As you can imagine, accounting standard setting bodies globally are paying close attention to the requirements around going concern basis of preparation and the related disclosures. So going through going through this flow chart on the screen, um, if you have material uncertainties around going concern, you'll end up in either the yellow or the blue boxes on the slide. Um, and if you end up there, then the expectation is that clear disclosures are required addressing the judgments made and uncertainties faced in regards to going concern assessment. There's a link to the publication um, in your slide pack and this explains the disclosures required um, and was re released following an update from the IFRS Foundation with an aim of reducing the divergence of disclosures across different entities and different industries. So well worth the read um, if you're required to have additional disclosures around going concern. Okay, so the next um, topic to discuss today is ASIC focus areas and FAQs. So firstly, just last month, ASIC have given us an extension of reporting deadlines, um, and this is relevant for many entities. The reason for the extension being granted is mainly due to resource constraints across accounting firms nationally, which is the reason why the extension only applies to entities with year ends in the peak period. So only for entities with reporting dates from the 23rd of June 2021 to the 7th of July 2021. Um, so essentially, if you have a 30 June year end, then you're included in this extension. Um, but please note the second point there is that the relief is not available for foreign registered companies as they do not fall into either Chapter 2M or Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act. Again, there's just a link on the slide here um, of the media release from ASIC. Um, so have a read if you want to clarify whether it applies to you. Another change by ASIC is that right of use assets, so your leased assets, will be able to be included in AFS licensees net asset value and surplus liquid funds calculations. And then I've also included a link to the ASIC Frequently Asked Questions page, which includes various staff FAQs, which can be useful resources when you want to see ASIC expectations or requirements on certain matters. And then the final ASIC related point is the recent ASIC enforcements um, included on this table, which might be a little difficult to read, sorry, but hopefully you can see. Um, so at the top, unsurprisingly, we have impairment with um, seven instances where uh, restatements were required following an ASIC inquiry. Um, and we're also seeing um, ASIC enforcements, a lot more activity in relation to non-lodgement of financial statements or late lodgements. Okay, so now moving on to common um, accounting issues or common queries that we're seeing coming through in recent times. Um, so firstly, onto impairment testing. And just a reminder that when preparing the impairment calculations, um, your recoverable amount is the higher of 
fair value or value in use. So it's if you've always typically done a value in use model, it may be worth having a look at the fair value um, route and seeing whether recoverable amount would actually be higher under that method. So this slide explains the different measurement approaches um, and the impact of COVID-19 on each approach, um, which I won't go into any detail. Um, as the main points I wanted to cover, so in regards to timing of impairment test, it's important to remember that not only is impairment testing required annually for goodwill and any indefinite life intangibles, but impairment testing is also required for all assets if there are any indicators of impairment. So for example, if my properties are not generating the cash flows that were expected, um, or if commodity prices suddenly take a fall that was not forecast in your original um, cash flow modelling, then this would be an impairment indicator and impairment testing is required. So even though the assets are amortised, um, you still need to take this additional step and perform impairment tests. So this slide is probably key for the impairment discussion today. Um, so it highlights the common issues or concerns around impairment testing that we are seeing. So generally, um, most entities are preparing five-year discounted cash flow models or life of mine models for their impairment testing. And we're already seeing many impairment models that are using a V-curve. Um, so while it does seem that the Australian economy has fared well um, during these times, it's a reminder that we are still in the height of a global pandemic. Um, there's still border closures and the government stimulus measures are starting to wind back. So in Australia, the second quarter results are not yet out. So we don't really know the effects of the end of JobKeeper um, and we're not sure yet um, how, how this will be felt across many different businesses. So in terms of your impairment modelling, it might be more appropriate to use um, a U-curve model or potentially even a W-curve may be more appropriate. And as impairment testing is a very complex and judgmental area and is once again a focus area for ASIC, we have developed some publications to assist you in your assessment and the links for these are on the next couple of slides. Um, so this one covers specifically around the impact of COVID-19 and how that can be factored into your impairment modelling and then impairment testing of right and use assets which have um, their own specific requirements. So the next section that I wanted to bring to your attention um, is common accounting queries or issues that we are seeing and unsurprisingly a lot of these is to do with modifications. So the most common being share-based payment and leases, but we're also starting to see modifications to loans and also modifications with customer contracts. So firstly, um, with the customer contracts, we are getting regular inquiries from clients with regards to AASB 15, and the current biggest issue is where customer contracts are modified. The requirements of AASB 15 are that contract modifications can only be accounted for as a separate contract to the original one when the scope of the contract changes due to additional promised goods or services that are distinct and the increase in price is reflective of the standalone selling price of the additional goods or services. So there are two conditions required to be able to say the new contract with an existing customer or a contract modification is a separate contract. What we are seeing is that it's a very rare situation where both these conditions are met, so it's unlikely that contract modifications would be treated as separate contracts. And when we start to modify contracts with customers, it tends not to be adding something 
plus paying fair value for that. Usually it's either receiving discounts for increasing the scope of the works or the scope of services are reduced. So where we have contract modifications that are not separate contracts, the modification can be treated as a termination where there is no adjustment to revenue recognised to date, or it could be treated as a continuation which will have revenue adjustments, or it could be a mixture of both. Contract modifications are a very complex part of AASB 15, so if you are modifying any contracts or entering into contracts with existing customers and you need guidance, please reach out and we're happy to guide you through this process. Uh, just quickly, other common AASB 15 issues that we are seeing include um, whether certain arrangements are actually in the scope of AASB 15 to begin with. So this is particularly relevant or this is, we're particularly seeing this um, in the oil and gas sector in determining whether counterparts, whether it be in-country government bodies or um, other parties to risk sharing arrangements arrangements and whether these are actually customers under the standard. Um, and if they're not, then you're not under AASB 15 and different accounting would apply. Um, we're also seeing a lot of questions around provision, provisionally priced arrangements um, and also timing for when revenue recognition um, can be met. So at what point is control deemed to have passed. Um, yeah, so these, these also continue to come up. Um, so just a couple of things to be mindful of. Turning now to lease accounting, uh, which is still probably the most complained about standard. Um, and we're definitely seeing a lot of questions, particularly in regards to mining services type arrangements and um, the leases that come out of those types of contracts can be quite complex and onerous to account for. So the ongoing management of AASB 16 is reflected in the diagram on this slide. Um, as you can see, there are many considerations needed with the ongoing management of leases. For example, what is the difference between a new lease and a modification or an extension of an existing lease? How are you accounting for COVID-19 rent concessions? How are you determining the discount rate for a modification or new lease? Are you aware that discount rate changes if you reassess the lease term? And then for all these questions, do you know when to expect a p and impact? When do you have to adjust your discount rate or when the changes impact the lease liability and right of use asset by the same amount? Also in the COVID environment, we're seeing a lot of lease modifications, mainly um, reductions in lease premises as more flexible working arrangements are adopted. And again, the accounting for these can be complex. There's also the COVID-19 related rent concessions, which has just had a recent change. Um, so just last month, the IASB said that if you get a reduction in lease payments for payments originally due on or before 30 June 2022, so not just 30 June 2021 as was the initial case, um, then you can still apply this practical expedient. So the date in criteria three uh, for on this slide um, is to be changed, so it's no longer payments to 30 June 2021 but it has been extended to 30 June 2022. And this is explained in the publication linked on this slide, which includes worked examples and whether retrospective application is required for rent concessions that went beyond this date and therefore initially would not have met the criteria for this practical expedient. This slide uh, just includes some links for further information on the BDO lease management services, which are becoming um, increasingly popular as the pain and complexity of lease accounting is increasing and uh, people are starting to realise that perhaps um, modelling 
your lease arrangements on Excel documents may not be the best way to go forward. And oh, I just wanted to take a moment here to get your views around WASB 16 um, now that it's been implemented for some time um, and get your views and how you anticipate the impact that lease accounting will have on your next reporting season. So the poll should be on your screen now. Um, so the question is, post implementation of WASB 16, how do you anticipate the impact of lease accounting on your next reporting period? I'll just give you a few moments to answer the poll question. Okay, just a couple more seconds for those who haven't yet voted. All right, excellent. Um, so I'll share the results. Um, and the majority are not expecting any issues, which is pleasing to see that a lot of you are on top of your lease management, um, which is great. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, okay, so moving on to share-based payments now, um, which over the past, I would say, six or seven months, um, we've been inundated with share-based payment inquiries. And I imagine this will only increase as we go forward. Um, as everyone would know, in Australia, particularly in WA, we have um, significant issues with regards to staffing. A lot of industries are facing staff shortages. Um, so what we're starting to see is that many entities are thinking about how, how do we retain our staff and many are looking at amending their share-based payment arrangements. So whether it be increasing service conditions but countering it with lower exercise price or reducing the performance conditions of arrangements. Any modification to a share-based payment causes great issues in the application as the share-based payment standard WASB2 contains a lot of complexity. Um, it's also written by the standard setters as an anti-avoidance um, standard. So they've tried to think about all the potential ways people could structure arrangements to suit them. Um, and put in specific paragraphs or um, requirements within the standard to ensure that this the commercial outcomes end up not being how it's reflected in the accounting for these arrangements. So like I said at the start, um, understandably, this is the most complained about standard that we have um, a lot of discussions about. So what we're also seeing is a lot of replacement awards where entities are attempting to incentivize staff um, by, for example, reducing unachievable market conditions. But mistakes in the application are being made, which can result in accelerated vesting, meaning increased share-based payment expense on the date of modification. So if it's not too late and you're considering modifying your share-based payment arrangements, it's a good idea to reach out to us um, or to your auditors to understand the accounting implications before you commit to any changes. And the final area, the final um, area in this section is modification to financial instruments. So under WASB 9, there are very specific rules on how to account for a modification to a loan, whether this is a change in repayment terms, interest rate or maturity date, these are all modifications that need to be assessed. So over the past um, few months and particularly more recently, we're seeing a lot of um, 
clients who are negotiating their loan arrangements, um, particularly extending out maturity dates. So with regards to these modifications, if the change in cash flow of the new arrangement compared to the carrying amount of the existing liability is greater than 10%, then this is a substantial modification. Um, which means that you de-recognise the existing liability and recognise a new, new liability using an updated discount rate. However, if the modification is non-substantial, so less than a 10% change, then you just adjust the carrying amount of the existing liability and any fees incurred are included in the new carrying amount and amortised over the remaining term. So as you can see, um, whether the mo modification is substantial or non-substantial can have very vast impacts on your P&L. Another modification we are seeing in this area um, is where financial liabilities are settled with equity instruments when this wasn't in the original terms with the creditor. IFRIC 19 is the relevant interpretation to address the accounting for this. Um, and in summary, it's not as straightforward. It's not as straightforward as saying you move the liability into equity. In most cases, there will be a P&L impact if the share issue is not done at market price of shares on the date of settlement. And um, the date of settlement point is critical here. So when you first start negotiating to settle the liabilities through issuing your own equity. Um, it may have been based on market prices at that point in time, but when actually when the settlement actually occurs, that may have changed. So something to keep in mind. And then finally, convertible notes, um, which again, we're seeing a lot more questions around these. Um, and this lovely and very complex looking diagram on the screen represents the complexity of convertible notes on a page. So the initial assessment of convertible note arrangements is by itself very complex, um, as you need to consider whether the instrument is debt, equity, a combination of both, and or are there embedded derivatives. Just this initial assessment generally requires a lot of judgment and interpretation um, of not only of the accounting standards, but of the agreements. And then it, on top of that, if you start modifying these arrangements, the accounting that follows is highly complex. Um, and we don't really have the time to go through that in this session, um, but I just wanted to point out that there is a really great video publication to assist you with making your way through this flowchart. Um, or of course, please contact us um, if, yeah, if it's too complex to follow what's in the guide um, or if any assistance is needed. Okay, so now turning to the future of financial statements um, and transitioning from special purpose to general purpose financial statements. From 1 July 2021, so just a couple of months away, the reporting entity concept will be removed. So from this date, any entities that have to prepare financial statements in accordance with Australian accounting standards must now prepare general purpose financial statements. The yellow, yellow box um, on the slide here, so this captures all entities that are required to report under the Corps Act. So exam, for example, any large PTYs or foreign owned entities who don't have ASIC reporting relief. And remember, this is applicable for large subsidiaries within your groups. Um, so these entities will now also need to prepare general purpose financial statements and will need to consolidate any entities that that entity controls. Whereas in the current state, these entities typically only prepare special purpose standalone financials. So there could be um, quite a big change on implementation of this. 
And then um, the green box um, shows that even for entities that do not, do not have Corps Act reporting requirements, if the entity's constitution or a trust deed requires accounts to be prepared in accordance with Australian accounting standards, and then that constitution or trust deed is amended at any point after 1 July 2021 um, for any reason, then these entities will now need to prepare general purpose financial statements. So as you can imagine, um, this, this new requirement could be quite far reaching and um, yeah, maybe, maybe reach entities that you initially thought probably wouldn't be affected by this. So when to transition from special purpose to general purpose. Um, so in the current year, you can still do special purpose if you're not a reporting entity, um, but if you do early adopt, so if you do do general purpose financial statements for 30 June 2021, then there are transition relief options. And what is really important is how do you transition from special purpose to general purpose? So this slide shows the different pathways depending on whether you have controlled entities or not. And if you have previously applied all recognition and measurement requirements in the most recent financial statements. So following the flow chart, if you are a single entity with no controlled entities, you go to the left down the blue boxes. Um, if all applicable recognition and measurement requirements were previously applied in the most recent special purpose financial statements, then all you have to worry about is additional disclosures. But if you didn't apply all recognition and measurement requirements, then on transition, you will need to adopt either IFRS 1 or IAS 8 and also include all the additional disclosures that are required. On the other side of the diagram, um, if you have controlled entities, then now you must consolidate. So again, if you previously consolidated and applied all recognition and measurement requirements, then you just need to worry about the new disclosures. However, if you haven't um, previously applied all the recognition and measurement requirements, or if you did not consolidate, then you will now need to adopt IFRS 1 or IAS 8 on transition. And then this slide just um, talks you through the um, different requirements and outcomes on either applying IFRS 1 or IAS 8. So IAS 8 generally requires full retrospective application, whereas IFRS 1 was designed to give entities a fresh start using the international framework. And then for tier two entities, there is a further practical expedient that allows the entity to use a route to IFRS without the need to present a restatement of comparative information. The different selection of options, so whether you go down IAS 8 or IFRS 1, um, or which optional exemptions you take can result in very different outcomes. So it's definitely worth thinking about this sooner rather than later. And it's potentially worth mapping out the different outcomes so you know the best pathway to take. I am just going to run another poll um, as I'm interested at this point to see how many people on the line would be impacted by the change from special purpose to general purpose. So if you can all just respond to this question. Um, whether there's going to be any impacts on this transition. Um, maybe you hadn't initially thought about your large PTY LTD within your group and the need for them to now move to general purpose. Okay, so we've got quite a good response rate. I'll just close the poll and share the results. Um, 
Yes, so majority feel that there will not be any impact um, and that's consistent with at the start the poll that we ran um, where this wasn't a critical topic for many people on the line. Um, but it is interesting to see that there are quite a number of people on the line who are unsure whether this will have an impact. So um, yeah, it's, it would be worth those people reaching out. Um, we have a lot of information um, and a lot of sessions that we're running to assist people in this process. Um, we've developed our, our BDO five step transition guide um, to help you through the transition assessment. Um, so a lot of people who answer D to the poll, um, the step one is probably critical to establishing, you know, what your requirements are. And then moving through, um, we can assist with general purpose financial statement, health checks, um, performing a gap analysis to identify any gaps between how you're currently accounting for certain um, certain issues and whether they comply with Australian accounting standards. We can assist um, in step four with implementing the transitional method and step five we can also assist in preparing disclosures for your general purpose financial statements. And as I mentioned we have a series of virtual workshops um, which may be very relevant even if you're not um, concerned about the transition to general purpose financial statements um, but these sessions will be you know, a great reminder of how um, each of the standard work each of the separate standard works and the issues con to consider in each of them so included in your slides there will be um, a link to to where you can register for these workshops And then my final topic for today is the new AASB 1060. So linked with the removal of the reporting entity concept, we also have this new standard called simplified disclosures. Um, so this standard is applicable for tier two entities as RDR is now withdrawn. Uh, the standard is applicable for reporting periods begin beginning on or after 1 July 2021, so consistent with the um, transition to general purpose financial statements. And the new standard is based on the disclosure requirements of the international standard IFRS for SMEs um, and the main changes from RDRs, which is what is currently um, being prepared for tier two entities is around additional disclosures required for areas um, particularly such as related party disclosures. Okay so that brings us to the end of the accounting updates. Um, Jane is now going to provide an update on governance and go through a couple of very interesting case studies. So I'll hand over to you Jane. Thanks, Ash. Um, so I'd like to speak a little bit about governance and I guess the takeaway from this is that to have a governance structure in place and also the frameworks underneath that governance structure are really important in terms of um, protection of your reputation in particular. Um, reputation is probably your most um, valuable asset and it can be lost fairly quickly if um, there is um, some event that um, um, is created through possibly not addressing risks or identifying risks early in the piece and manage them, managing them. Um, if you could go to the first slide please Ash. I just wanted to give you an idea of, of what a typical governance structure is and, and many of you will already have this in place and it's a very simplified version. 
So you have your board who's ultimately responsible and your policies, procedures, your monitoring, your reporting process, which is um, um, often undertaken by your executive level, reporting up to your CEO, CFO, Chief Risk Officer. And you also have your oversight from your committees, which are in sense um, um, assistance, provide assistance to the board and report back to the board. Um, next slide, please, Ash. Um, what I want to draw to your attention is it's a structure in itself um, is not always the best way of going about protecting um, the organisation because there's, there's circumstances where um, governance or where um, issues have caused problems and what are those and generally that they're the frameworks that sit underneath those particular governance structures and I'm just going to give you um, an example today. So failures of um, or when when things do go wrong it's often um, the cause of failure of a governance structure and by that it means that there isn't one in place. So that there isn't a formalised structure where there's terms of reference and responsibilities for each of the um, structures that you require. An example of that is a risk management framework if you don't have a risk management framework in place. When you don't have this, it leads on to lack of ability to identify risks, in particular emerging risks. And this may very well be, for example, ESG. Where it also goes wrong is the communication and elevation of issues or risks between the various levels in the organisation, in the company. And of course, it depends on your size um, and very much depends on your size. And having that um, risks identified at a lower level may not be elevated up into risk registers and into the um, oversight of either the executive or the board. So inadequate mitigation and control, sometimes risks are identified, but they're not revisited frequently enough to the changing environment to understand whether they're sufficient to help you mitigate um, a risk or at least control a risk, or at least be aware that the risk needs to be reported or alternatively that the risk is increasing. So you've got to think really carefully about what mitigation controls you have in place. Accountability is always a big one. And we've seen this um, across, and I'm, I'm not certain of this, but I would imagine that th this may have certainly been the issue um, in Victoria when the um, quarantine hotels inquiry took place and um, the security companies employed, and there was no one that was able to be put forward as being signing off on the various contracts. And that could be an issue with accountability structures that you have in your governance structure or your governance framework and particularly your risk management frameworks. And then finally, it's oversight. And oversight is very much about um, if you don't have a process of recording, communicating and elevating that's clear and articulated in your policies and procedures, um, the oversight and the ability to, to um, oversee risk within the organisation um, is limited. And therefore, this exposes uh, the organisation to um, greater risk than, than you would have identified. Uh, next, please, Ash. I, I just want to give this as a current example. And this plays, and it, I'm giving this one because it is current. Um, I'm making no suggestion that it's certainly the case um, in the Perth Casino um, Royal Commission. Um, but you could see it across the Banking Royal Commission. You see it across all inquiries. And the, and the responses, and once again, this is from um, the ABC News Online, so we have to take it as a media report other, rather than um, it has the veracity of actual um, the inquiry reporting. But it indicates some of the issues that you have. You may very well have a governance structure in place, uh, but you may not have, and this is the top, um, I've blacked out names here because that's certainly not relevant um, to the discussion we're having today. Um, 
and I think that would be also unfair given the circumstances that the Commission is um, continuing. Um, where there wasn't risks and policies, uh, there wasn't policies and procedures in place to deal with risks that were, um, would have otherwise been possibly clear risks and identified if a thorough process had been undertaken. Um, the next one down from that is one that gives an example of reporting of a risk. Um, expressing a risk or, or an event or a conflict is simply not enough and this is why it's important within your policies and procedures that you clearly articulate that things are need to be reported um, not verbally but in writing and also elevated and that allows your board or your executive then to manage and mitigate um, any risks or at least control risks. The one on the top right is an example of um, you know, possible mitigation. This may have very well been the case and there may have very well been an advantage to travel to these sites. However, they need to look at how we mitigate against um, the risk that our reputation will be tarnished by the fact that it appears in this circumstance, and I'm not sure that um, possibly the organisations themselves had hosted rather than um, the company in which you work for or the department in which you work for um, actually um, uh, managing the, the visit. The next one is about accountability. I maintain the view that it's someone else's role. If your policies and procedures clearly articulate who's ultimately responsible, who you to report to and when things are to be reported up, then this sort of lack of clarity and um, increased level of risk um, isn't experienced. And finally, the last one is um, just a warning about waiting. Uh, if you do identify any events that may develop into something larger than it is at the time, uh, address it immediately because when you wait, circumstances may overtake and you may lose control. So you're better off in a situation where you're able to control events rather than um, waiting time and losing that control because of circumstances that are outside of your control. Uh, next one, please, Ash. So just a final takeaway. Um, ensure that your organisation is thinking beyond its financial risks. Generally, financial risks are well managed. Um, that's a rather broad statement, but they are because they relate directly to performance. And it's also a very highly regulated area of our corporate responsibility. It's the non-financial risks and particularly emerging ris risks, and ESG has been given as an example, are the ones that you really need to start to also focus on to ensure that you can protect your reputation and therefore um, your performance. Thanks, Ash. That's all from me. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jane, for that. Um, and thanks to all of you who have remained on the line for the entire webinar and those of you who participated in the poll questions. Um, so that is that closes all the topics that we wanted to address today. Um, but before you go, I just wanted to highlight that on the next few slides, I've included the upcoming um, schedule of video national webinars um, that are run monthly. And um, we've also got a not-for-profit specific webinar that will be hosted by BDO's head of IFRS advisory and BDO's not-for-profit leader. So the links are included in your slide pack if you want to register for those events. And then finally, um, just the contact details of the BDO IFRS advisory team across the nation. So please reach out to any one of us for any assistance um, and we'd be more than happy to help or refer you to the relevant BDO contact. Once again, thanks everyone for your attendance today and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.